Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to ESG Talks, a KBRA podcast series focusing on environmental, social, and governance, ESG. This podcast series highlights various ESG hot topics and includes commentary from prominent voices within the ESG community. In this episode of ESG Talks, Pat Welch, KBRA's Chief ESG and Ratings Policy Officer, interviews Stephen Gluckstern, the Chairman and CEO of Santa Fe Farms. Santa Fe Farms is a fully integrated company leading the growth and development of the industrial hemp industry. Santa Fe Farms spans the growth, transformation, and impact of industrial hemp into key wellness, chemical, and physical ingredients and components, which can be incorporated into thousands of products in categories including health, human and animal nutrition, agriculture, building materials, paper and packaging, plastics, and advanced carbon materials. Santa Fe Farm will be both a net negative carbon business itself and an important source of offsets available to other enterprises seeking to reduce their carbon footprint to meet ESG goals and or regulatory requirements. Pat and Steven speak about the role the hemp industry might play in mitigating the effects of climate change across the globe, while also creating positive social impact. Hi, I'm Pat Welch, Head of ESG and Ratings Policy at KBRA. Stephen, it's, it's great to be with you to discuss this important and I'll say fascinating topic. I'd really like to start in at a high level. Your company has had an interesting evolution. Your core business is industrial hemp production, but over time you've become centered around carbon and the positive impact that the hemp industry can have on mitigating climate change. Why was Santa Fe Farms founded and how does its mission fit into the ESG movement? Thanks, Pat. Pleasure to be here. When we first started Santa Fe Farms, like most people, I think we were learning about the hemp business. We knew enough of what everyone had read in the newspaper. I think as everybody knows, this was a a prohibited business for a hundred years and was only really sort of come to the forefront in 2019. And most of the discussion about hemp was about CBD and the other medical and wellness uses. We began to focus, however, on industrial hemp, as you've mentioned. The notion that this plant has many other aspects in terms of what it can do and the products that can be made. And which we were farmers, like everybody else. We started with a farm and we started with, a, with some expertise and in, in, in learning how to grow this plant. But what we found out very quickly was that the real value of this plant may go way beyond the products that one can make from it, and rather its impact on climate. Industrial hemp, as we know it today, sequesters as much carbon per acre as, for instance, an acre of rainforest. And so what became apparent to us was that as we look for nature-based solutions, to the CO2 crisis, that one of those might well be hemp. And over the last three years, we've really now come to understand that, believe that, and are looking forward to building a business that wonderfully has both aspects. A product that can be made that is good and has lots of applications, can help replace a lot of the hydrocarbon economy, but at the same time also sequesters CO2, which has got to be one of the biggest and most important challenges, certainly of this generation. Great. Can you take that a little bit further, talk a little more specifically about the uses of hemp and the role the industry can play in the transition to a low carbon economy? Also, what are some of the knock on benefits of growing hemp? Sure. So just for a little background, obviously, hemp was used by the Phoenicians to conquer the world and a bunch of other people over some 8000 years. Right. There's lots of stories that it sits at the base of the Great Wall of China, that Betsy Ross sewed her first American flag from it, that our money's made from it, that the Declaration of Independence, in fact, was written on hemp paper, the first two versions of it. So there's a long history of this plant being around. It makes the strongest natural rope fiber of anything we know. It's done that for years and years and years. Our Navy in the Second World War, despite the fact that hemp was outlawed, was growing its own hemp to make ropes. For the Navy. And so there's a whole series of products associated with a natural fiber that is high in cellulose and high in carbon content, which is one of the reasons the second half of the story has emerged. So, from a product perspective, over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to see hemp put in more and more products. And the use of its fiber and its herd in strengthening concrete, in building products, in natural feed sources, hemp grain. And hemp seed is a highly nutritious form of feed for humans and animals. So there's a whole series of industrial products that I think you'll see. Now, remember, the reason there aren't big markets for it today is it was outlawed until three years ago, right? So that all of that basically, which was 100 years ago, is now having to come back in. The, I'll call it the E of the ESG story, though, is that, as I mentioned earlier, 
This plant sequesters CO2. It takes CO2 out of the air using photosynthesis and basically buries that carbon in its roots. So if, if you believe over time that the solution to the carbon crisis and CO2 in our atmosphere, that one part of that will be in nature-based solutions, not the only solution, but one part of it is based in nature-based solutions, then hemp has a very, very powerful role to play in that transition. No, not the only plant, but by the way, as far as we know, it's as efficient as any other form of vegetation that we know on the face of the earth. So, you know, I, I think you, know, Pat, you and I have had previous discussions. We need to find a way to take CO2 out of our atmosphere and put it back into the earth or into the ocean. Those are the only two places you can put it. Ocean's complicated and difficult because you can't get down there, but farmland is not. And we are convinced that that's part of the solution to the drawdown of CO2, which is going to be critical for our existence on this planet. That's fascinating. And you hinted a little bit at this, but could you draw us more of a picture of what the biggest barriers are to expanding the industrial hemp industry in the U.S.? Certainly, it feels like we've lost a lot of decades over it being illegal. But w what are the barriers that remain? So obviously, there's still some of the view that isn't this the plant that marijuana comes from? And therefore, there's sort of this anxiety about it. You know, it's, it's not fully legal. Everyone's confused. By the way, when people do CBD, is that, you know, what, what's the story back there? So all of that, there's some education that needs to happen. But I'd say the biggest impediment going forward is scalability, because the demand for this product will outstrip its supply for many years to come. And just to get here some numbers for your listeners, today we grow roughly 90 million acres of corn in the United States, roughly 90. By the way, just as an aside, two thirds of that goes to feed animals, not to feed humans. So there's a whole nother story we could talk about there. Last year in the United States, maybe a quarter million acres in total, all hemp grown in the US. So when you think about the need, and if you go and talk to a major packaging company, a company that's sending out billions of boxes a year, and you go to them and say, you know, I could give you a hemp box, they're very interested because they know that cutting down trees doesn't make sense. But you can't go to them and say, I can make you 10,000 boxes. So the answer is, they say, great, we like this. We'll invest in it. Can you make 10 million boxes? Because if you can't make 10 million boxes, it can't really help me. And so I would say the scalability question, this idea is how do you get from a standing start to sizeable, you know, is that is the biggest impediment. Most of my colleagues and my peers in this business, these are small businesses. And, you know, you're growing a few thousand acres. The answer is we have to grow millions of acres, and that's going to take some time. And that is, in, in some way, there's a capital need. I was talking to someone this morning. Imagine that you had a very effective farmer and that they could grow hemp at $750 an acre. That's kind of the number that people are saying, if you are a really good farmer and you're growing industrial hemp, it probably costs you $750 an acre. It's not bad, except when you think you're going to have to grow, let's just say, 10 million acres over time. That means that each year that's seven and a half billion dollars. So to get from here to there, that's going to be the challenge. So that sounds like a significant barrier. You mentioned education and education around ESG broadly. You know, many terms used in ESG space, words like sustainable and green, carbon neutral, they really lack a common definition and they can be frankly very subjective. One of KBRA's priorities is providing nuanced analysis we feel ESG issues need and, and deserve instead of painting a, you know, certain industries or activities or companies as simply good or bad or, or giving them a very simplified, opaque kind of how do you derive it kind of score. We're looking to tell the, the real nuanced story. With that, how is Santa Fe Farms going about this sort of re-education around climate mitigation, do you think the strategy can be applied to ESG more broadly? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it, it's a conundrum in a lot of ways. And let me start by saying that when we first started our business, we didn't think of ourselves as an ESG solution, right? We were looking at a product that we thought made sense industrially. It made sense, by the way, from a capitalist perspective, we could grow it and sell it for more than we cost to grow it. And we could build a business that way. It was in that the three to four intervening years that we began to realize that this turned out to be an incredible e-story because it was about a plant and a product 
that actually was good for the environment. That as you grow this plant, you sequester CO2. The beautiful news is at the end of it, you have this great product that you can create, whether it be putting it in plastics or in roads, whatever you're going to do with it, but at the same time, drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. So for us, we became an e-story, but not by greenwashing, not, but it wasn't the design. We said, wow, our basic business is a story about doing something for the environment. And the good news is we have a product. For most industrial products, that's not necessarily true, right? They're in the gasoline business or they're in the business of producing electricity. And the pressure now mounts on those businesses to say, wait a second, how do you conduct your business in a way that is creates the least damage possible to the environment. Forget about even in the beginning that helps the environment. And I think that that's where this sort of interesting conundrum in education came, which is that our business is the business of ESG, right? We're in the business of creating something that sequesters carbon. We think we can do that in a lot of other ways. For most industrial businesses, the pressure now on them is to say, okay, I need to conduct my business in a way that reduces my impact on the environment. And so I would say that the education process now has both arms to it. It has the, here's what hemp is. Here's why it's a business that really is about the environment. But for most major industrial companies, it's how do I do my business while beginning to reduce my footprint? And that's what you hear. I mean, as you know, that you can't pick up a newspaper or pick up an ad or go on an airplane without someone telling you about carbon neutrality, right? We're going to be carbon neutral or we're going to be carbon negative. Which implies a transition for most companies. They've got a transition. It has to be because it was a priority that people didn't think about, right? So that's part of the education challenge here. What does that mean? And let's pick the industry that's the most vulnerable here, or the one that people target, and that's the business of oil and gas, right? Because that very business releases CO2 into the air. So how do you begin to have those businesses begin to develop a consciousness and both not go out of business, stay in business, but how do they reduce what they do and how they do it? And that's really the education process here of understanding where does this come from? How do we get to carbon drawdown? And so we at Santa Fe Farms are trying to do both, right? We ourselves are conducting a business that's focused on being good for the environment because that's good for our business. And then how do we begin to have and provide some resources to the rest of industries? One of the things that we talked about previously is the use of carbon credits and the way in which most businesses are going to start is by saying, okay, I can reduce my carbon footprint to X, but I can't get below X because X is my business. I make plastic. And you know the answer is plastic comes from hydrocarbons. So what do I do in the interim as we get more and more technology? And the answer is you buy carbon credits and you buy them from people like me. Because at the end of the day, the growing of hemp creates carbon credits, right? That's the beauty of, I said, our business is really not a business about, it It is the carbon business, right? And so we are growing a plant that sequesters carbon. So the, I think the education part is very, very important here. I think a bunch of corporations, by the way, and we saw that through, you know, left on mics from lobbyists for Exxon, that I think people, they're not sure how to get there. And a lot of people say, I'm going to tell the story, but I don't, I can't really transform my business. I think the pressure mounts every day on those industries. You need to be able to find a way, not by the way, to eliminate your production of CO2. No one expects that in the short term, but beginning to talk about how companies responsibly respond to this. And that starts with education. Do you understand what it is, why it is, and then how do we begin to tell that story? Fantastic. You know, you mentioned greenwashing, which refers to the process of falsely labeling or misrepresenting products or investments as quote unquote, green or sustainable, when in many cases, they have very little positive environmental impact. Can you tell me how what Santa Fe Farms is doing is an antidote to the concerns surrounding greenwashing? I'm not sure it's an antidote as much as it maybe help other corporations provide a way to not greenwash. The buying of carbon credits from someone like us who creates them by what we do in our core business, I think is a viable part of a strategy to reduce the carbon footprint. And so a corporation that is, you know, I, you know these numbers, I think we, we've talked about them. There's about 50 billion tons a year of excess CO2 produced. We produce a lot more than that, but about 50 billion. And when they talk about a carbon neutral, that means we have to reduce our production by 50 billion tons. By the way, that doesn't even account for the fact that we've got to do drawdown from what we've already put up there. So how does a company do that? And the only way to do that is you look at your own behaviors, your own own mechanics, your own the things that you do, and then teaming up with companies like ours to say, look, what can you produce and how can that help me offset my footprint? And taking that seriously, as opposed to simply saying, let's find a way to make it look like we're doing this 
and then it really it really won't match. So I, I do think that you're going to see, and that's again, go back to the education question. I think senior management in these in industrial companies have to begin to say, I'm going to take this seriously and really figure out how do I reduce my footprint? And to be honest with you, that I, you know, I'm talking to the senior management in lots of industrial companies and most of them are taking it seriously. I don't, this is not to, you know, there are obviously little pockets of people who say it's not that relevant. But I would say that the majority of our senior management in our industrial economy are beginning to realize this is not a fake problem. This is not a problem that's going to go away on its own. And by the way, it's a, a, a problem that affects your grandchildren and their grandchildren, all of ours, whether or not you're in the greenwashing business or not in the greenwashing business. You know, I, I think we, we've talked about this. We cut down trees at the rate of 10 billion a year. That's the net reduction of trees on the face of the earth. I'd say there are only 3 trillion trees left, but the truth is if you don't change your behavior in 300 years, there'll be no trees. And if there are no trees, by the way, there's no oxygen. So these are truly existential issues, whether you believe that man's a cause or not, right? Doesn't matter your belief. Our effect on our environment is now profound, which is why I think the ESG movement has developed. And I think people are beginning to recognize this is no longer an academic topic. This is a topic that will affect all of us and our children and our children's children. Absolutely. I think the E part of Santa Fe Farms mission is clear, but importantly, you, you also have social goals as well. Can you speak a little more about what you see as the social opportunities for the hemp industry and for your company? Sure. And, and this actually is really important to me personally, as, as well as to the, all, of, all the people who and our shareholders. So one of the things that we began thinking about is, okay, if you were going to grow hemp at scale, if you're going to get there, where are you going to grow it? And the answer is you've got to find land to grow. And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I, I live in New Mexico and, and many of my good friends and partners are, are longtime New Mexicans. We have one of the highest rates of uh, the highest percentage of Native Americans living here. And we began a conversation with some of our Native American friends and said, listen, what do you think about leading the effort in terms of carbon sequestration and describing this as an Native American opportunity. Native Americans control 52 million acres in the United States. It's a big number. Some of the oldest water rights in the U.S. And in some ways, Native Americans, in many ways, have been mistreated by, by those of us from European heritage who, who ended up here, or the Spanish that came in the 1500s. You know, we, we, we've ended up creating a system here by which Native Americans, we, we describe it as they get, we gave them the four addictions alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and sugar to, a, to an extent in terms of the addictions that we've given them. Why not think of them as leading the effort in terms of carbon? They have 53 million acres. And if we think about this as a product that we can grow to help sequester, we can create basically a circular economy here. Because not only do you help sequester the carbon, but for the whole reasons that we're in the business, it's a significant economic opportunity to create products that can be sold off reservation. So we have made a very big effort to focus on indigenous peoples and how do indigenous peoples benefit and provide part of the solution here, as well as as just, you know, the idea that we're trying to do, do good by, you know, righting some wrongs historically. But this is true outside the U.S. as well. Well, our focus is largely indigenous, but I, I literally just hung up the phone, a long discussion about looking at Africa and what we're doing in Africa and how hemp could be grown there. We have an operation in Thailand. We have an operation in Chile. We have an operation in Costa Rica. So we're very, very concerned and, and poised to say, you know what, this is an opportunity to also provide, you know, indigenous peoples. And, you know, these numbers, I think, are, are fairly known. That's basically 5% of the world's population. They control 20% of the land mass are controlled by that 5%, and 80% of the biodiversity in the world is on those acres. So we see a tremendous role here for indigenous people, part of our ethos. And so we love the fact that in an ESG world, usually you can get one of the initials, but in our case, you got two of the initials. So that's important to us. That's really amazing. And to remedy, you know, a historic inequality that's existed all over the world that would be truly amazing. Yeah, I could, Pat, I just, you know, one of the our core partners here, I'm confident enough to say this publicly, is going to be the Yakima Indians out of Washington, the, the Native Americans. The Yakima Reservation is 1.4 million acres, just to give people a sense of what Yakima control. Half of that is forest, many hundreds of thousands of acres of irrigated land. We're talking, we'll do a pilot project with them this year and begin to grow hemp along with the Osage and the Southern Ute. So we have a big emphasis on bringing the Native Americans into the solution here. They're so used to seeing extractive industries. Now, here's an industry that I think can really be a growth industry for them and allow us to improve the quality of our environment. 
what an amazing story that would be. Stephen, last question for you. Do you think the momentum around ESG investing will influence the trajectory of the hemp industry and other innovative sectors related to, to climate mitigation? What short and long-term financial opportunities do you see coming from the expansions in the industrial hemp agriculture? A great series of questions. So let me answer the first part of that, which is, and the answer is there is no doubt in my mind that as dollars flow into ESG investing, that provides a capital opportunity for those of us in the hemp industry. Remember, we, we gave some of those numbers of what it would actually cost to grow 90 million of acres of hemp, or even if that was the number you wanted, you know, we're, we're talking about a billion dollars per eight per million acres, right? So, so the answer is that availability of that capital and that capital looking at this will have a profound effect on the hemp industry. And obviously, we hope to be at the beginning part of that. I think you'll also see innovative. I think it's going to drive innovation in the use of these kinds of products in traditional industries. So, for instance, the plastics industry, and most, most you'd be surprised how many Americans, when you talk about plastic and you ask them where it comes from, they can't give you the answer without understanding it comes from hydrocarbons, right? And that once they figure out it's coming from oil, they go, wow, that's, see, that's problematic. And the answer is, yes, it's problematic. And so I think it'll drive innovation as well in those kind of extractive industries. And so I think it has a very, very profound effect. I do think that for a company like ours, we will seek to use people who want to invest in ways that support the environment and social justice and governance. That they, we will look for that. And I think that will fuel us and will fuel us more quickly than we would if we were sitting there having to rely on traditional private and public markets to fund us. That is fantastic. Well, it's, it's so exciting what you're doing and the relevance to the broader ESG story happening in the world, but also in the capital markets and in, in the place where KBRA is focused, the debt capital markets. This is a really exciting development. It's, it's the kind of innovation that the world needs, and it seems like you're on the cusp of something very big. And so, look, I, I wanted to just say thanks for spending time with us, sharing this story, and it's really great to hear from you. Well, thanks for, for, for your interest in taking the time. We, we appreciate it and look forward to many more opportunities to talk. Great. Thank you to Pat and Stephen for a very interesting discussion. Please email ESG at KBRA.com with any questions or comments. We also encourage you to visit KBRA's ESG website at ESG.KBRA.com, where you can find the details of KBRA's ESG approach, all of our ESG research, podcasts, and other ESG-related media items. You can also join our mailing list to access our ESG Weekly Roundup newsletter. This concludes our episode. New episodes of ESG Talks air every other week. In the meantime, please visit KBRA.com to access our other podcast series, as well as our ratings and research. Thank you.